we are live welcome back once again it is friday august 7th and this is my own show for giants youtube channel for those who don't know i am joseph ward the founder author and creator of on the shoulders of giants um i've been doing on the shoulders of giants for about what uh since 2014 and i started doing this because i came across a group of young young black children who had no idea who Harriet Tubman was and that right there don't sit right with me um so i made sure i created on the shows with giants to provide stories of the sons and unsung heroes of the african diaspora uh african history at your fingertips and little known black history uh unknown black culture all those different things i do my best to find the information and expose you to it and find others who know the information and be able to expose you to it so that's another reason why we're here today so you can check out my website at www.ontheshoulders1.com as you see on the screen and if you would like to support me you can go to patreon.com backslash o-t-s-o-g and you can support me um on uh patreon as well um and just you know once again thank you for everybody being here thank you for all the support thank you for tuning in please make sure you like this video comment subscribe make sure you share it because that definitely helps the analytics and everything move forward and get more people to view this video so like comment subscribe and share all right so today today is a is a great one because this gentleman that's on the screen with me i met him when he was around 21 to 22 years old uh it was a it was i guess you could say it was a unexpected meeting when i first met him because I was invited to a to a gathering, and the intention was to uh, connect with another young man, and I did connect with that young man. But I started talking history with this young man, and we were just talking for hours about uh, certain history. And at the age of twenty two, I was what uh, thirty, maybe thirty at the time. He's twenty two, and he knew more history of Tallahassee. Like he he knows it like the back of his hand. But I was overly impressed at such a young age how how thorough he was with history, how informed and, and studied he was with history. Um, over the years, he's created an organization called the National Association for the Preservation of African American History and Culture. And that organization is dedicated to preserving African American history, historical sites, and, and just all types of aspects that go with black history untold black history or um black history that's covered up um his name is delatra hollinger he says he's the founder of the national association for the preservation of african-american history and culture he's a stout historian he's definitely a beacon in our tallahassee community and i welcome him to my own shows of giants channel what's up man how you doing joe i appreciate you inviting me Oh man, I appreciate you for being here and I appreciate you for for everything that you bring to the table, man. Also, like I was saying, you put me you put me on to a lot of Tallahassee history, black history in Tallahassee. And uh I like the fact that black preservation is something that you are stout on and um just everything you bring to the table, man. You're a dynamic young man. So I'm always gonna do what I have to do or do what I can to help you out. I appreciate it so, and um, I appreciate it. No problem, man. So let's let's start from the beginning. Um, okay. Kind of give the people some background information about yourself. Let's start there. Um, who are you and just how you got to this point where you are now? Well, I'm um, I'm the Latry Hollinger, um, native of Tallahassee, uh, born and raised in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, I'm, I'm fifth generation. Um, my, um, great, great grandparents were slaves, um, on mm -hmm. Leon soil. So, uh, the interest actually in history, um, came when I was about two years old. I remember my mom, okay. uh, had bought a, a, a whole collection of books, but they were on some of our black heroes, like, uh, Miriam mm -hmm. uh Benjamin Banneker, W.E.B. Du Bois, and um, I so so really from like the age of two years old um, to now, the the mm -hmm. uh, the the desire to learn 
uh, that history and to uh, preserve it uh, more recently uh, has just grown and it's just gotten uh, right. greater and greater. So a little bit about me. Um, I, I founded the organization uh, NAPAC in 2013, so about seven years ago. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, we've been doing some great work um, ever since. Um, as you know yourself as a board member, um, you know, trying to do what we can to um, protect and preserve uh, not only historic properties, but stories. Because, you know, every right. time one of our, every time one of our ancestors passes away, um, you know, all of the stories, all of the memories and that legacy um, goes yeah. with them. It is not recorded. Right. I know that we worked right. on a project uh, a few years back mm-hmm. where we were recording and interviewing um, a lot of our uh, local heroes, um, a lot of right. whom are or even even from the people that we interview who are no longer here. So uh, it's mm-hmm. really, really important. It's extremely important because it's up to us. It's up to our generation yeah. um, to, to make sure that those stories are told, to put it on paper, uh, to publish the books and to to keep putting it in front of people's faces. And once you put it in front of people's faces, then it's on them at that point, because we right. all, every single one of us have an obligation once we know it. It's, it's one thing mm-hmm. not to know it, but once we know it and once we have that knowledge, then we have that obligation to protect and preserve the right. stories, right. the memories of these people and the legacy. So um, right. that's uh, just just a small, small bit about okay. me. Um, I was uh, I've been active in the community for about. 12 years, I would say, um, since I was about uh, 14 years old, um, mm-hmm. working on working on different projects. Um, one of the most recent projects um, that was instrumental in working on was um, uh, designating Orange Avenue uh, to the memory right. of the Reverend C.K. Steele. Um, right. So now, now one of our major roadways that goes from one end of Tallahassee to the other um mm-hmm. is, is is dedicated in honor of the Reverend C.K. Steele, who was really right. a giant um in not right. only in the city of Tallahassee, but really throughout the nation and the world. Um he was right. he was a very well known civil rights giant leader. Um and so really just working on making sure the history of our community, but also of other communities is preserved, um, has been something I've been working on. Um, I also served as a uh, president of our local NAACP um, branch uh-huh. here in Tallahassee um, and actually was the youngest uh, president in our branch's history. Yeah, you were uh, at that time at uh, 24 years old. And so um, right. that was that was an honor. It was an honor really just to follow in the footsteps of people like the Reverend C.K. Steele and Dan Speed and the Reverend R.N. Gooden. And um, mm-hmm. people like Anita Davis and Dr. Charles Evans. So uh, just that alone to know that um, they had occupied that seat uh, before me, you know, that was an honor. Those are really uh, some true giants in our community. So um, now I'm uh, like everybody else. We, we're trying to get through COVID, um, but also um, COVID, I think, has given us an opportunity to um, <laughs> focus and concentrate, write those books that yeah. we ain't had a chance to write, um, right. Right. And, and just really focus on some things that we're trying to do. Okay, definitely, definitely. So um, I want to, I do want to go further into uh, Reverend C.K. Steele because I want to kind of have you give some of the stories of Reverend C.K. Steele, also Reverend R.N. Gooden. But before we get to that, um, NAPAC. I want people to mo- know more about NAPAC as well. So, um, kind of give us give us a breakdown of NAPAC, uh, how it started, why you started it, and um, just uh, just more information. The website and everything. Oh, it's right here, but all the information about NAPAC. Well, um, 
the National Association uh, for the Preservation of African American History and Culture started because all over the country, um, really between 2010 and 2013, um, I started to see a lot of uh, historic buildings, uh, historic mm-hmm. black neighborhoods um, here in Tallahassee, but also elsewhere that were being gentrified, that were being um, mm-hmm. destroyed. And, uh, you know, once you once you tear down a building, um, that building is gone. You know, you, mm-hmm. you know, so, some things you can come back from. But once once you once you destroy a historic church that's been standing for 150 years or once you tear down a house or a building or, or uh, uh, a school um, that's that's been somewhere for over a century. Um, that's meant so much to our people and our legacy. Uh, that's gone forever. So um, right. that resonated with me. That really resonated with me. And um, it, it it made me really want to do something about it because it was happening at such an alarming um, rate uh, in neighborhoods and across the country and still is. So I wanted to create yes, an organization is. that would really serve as an advocacy organization like even if we didn't have any money if we didn't have any money if we didn't have any paid staff if we didn't have any contributions coming in i thought there needed to at least be an advocacy nonprofit organization that could send letters make telephone calls um gather gather up other concerned citizens who would contact uh local government or developers or whoever um to try to say look you know, this building, um, A, B, and C happened here. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, one of the most important ones I think that we worked on, uh, Joseph, was the old Leon County Jail um, that yeah. is now demolished. Um, that was a project that we worked on with NAPAC for four years, um, really, really to try to let people know that um, this jail, this is where the first civil rights um jail in took place mm-hmm. um the first the first jail in in the in the country in the nation um when the students from HBCUs and PWIs across the country started sitting in at lunch counters that segregated Tallahassee was we our students were the first to go to jail yes. and to refuse to yeah. pay fines uh, for that because they felt that if they paid the fines, they'd be paying for segregation. In Greensboro, North Carolina, mm-hmm. you had these student centers in, in North Carolina, but they paid the fines. Well, our students in right. Tallahassee, Florida, a and and FSU said, we're not paying for segregation, so you all can incarcerate us and and, and, and we, will, we will stay here. And so they served out their jail sentences. That was really significant. That was the first time that had ever happened in anywhere in the United States. And so um, it, even the, the Tallahassee bus boycott, um, you know, they, they arrested Reverend C.K. Steele numerous times. Uh, the two students from Florida and then Willie Minnie Jakes and Kara Patterson, who had been arrested yes. for, um, for refusing to give up their seats in 1956. Mm-hmm. The Tallahassee bus boycott, which came along five months after the Montgomery bus boycott, was mm-hmm. the second most successful bus protest in the country. Um, and, you know, and, and that made national headlines. The student sit-ins made national headlines. I know we just lost, um, Congressman John Lewis, um, right. who was instrumental in the Voting Rights Act and in what happened in Selma when the state troopers attacked demonstrators. But there was also an incident here in Tallahassee, many people don't know about, that occurred on March the 12th of 1960 okay. when, 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 um, there were some student sit-ins taking place downtown. Uh, about eight FSU and FAMU students were arrested. And so Patricia Stevens do went back to campus right. um, and she got together about 1,800 students um, wow. in total. I think that about a group of a group of a few hundred students um, were trying to march downtown to the jail on one side. I think uh, present day uh, Wanish Way. And then, right. um, then there was a group of about a thousand that was trying to march um, 
on Adams Street and and, and Family Way where the railroad tracks are. And um, but that that group was the other group was attacked with uh, bats by the White Citizens Council. The wow. second group of about a thousand students was met by state troopers and Tallahassee police officers um, who very similar to Selma asked them to disperse. And so they started throwing tear gas bombs into the crowd. Um, this was covered in newspapers all over the country. Mm -hmm. It was in, there were pictures of it in jet magazine. And this is actually when Patricia Stevens do suffered permanent uh, damage to her eyesight. Right. Because right. The police officer recognized her and threw a tear gas bomb into her, her eyes. So, oh, wow. um, you know, we we have had our own um, national nationally significant events uh, right here in the right. state capital of Florida. And I think that uh, where whereas you had other states like Alabama and Mississippi who had um, openly racist uh, governors, you know, we had uh, Leroy Collins, who was more of a moderate when it came to civil rights. As a matter of fact, uh, uh -huh. shortly after incident I just discussed with you, he came on uh, television and said that um, it was morally wrong uh, to have uh, segregation. And so that was well received by civil rights leaders. So um, there was not a governor in the United States that was talking like that at that time. You know, we had, right. we had George Wallace in Alabama who was standing in the schoolhouse door and um, these, these other governors in Mississippi who would not protect um, civil rights demonstrators. So, uh, mm -hmm. and then the, the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964. Um, I'm gonna say this, and then I'm gonna get back to your question. Um, you could. That, the 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 Civil Rights Act was passed because of what happened in Florida, because okay, uh, Dr. Robert Haling, uh, a dentist out of St. Augustine, who had been born and raised in Tallahassee, his father was a professor at FAMU. Mm -hmm. uh, the Haling House is still standing on Young Street. Um, right. Dr. Haling was the leader of the civil rights movement in St. Augustine. He called Dr. King because it was so much um, so much turmoil going on in St. Augustine uh, that he had Dr. King and Andrew Young, Reverend C.K. Steele, uh, Ralph Abernathy, and others to come to St. Augustine. And Dr. King said himself, that St. Augustine, Florida was the most lawless place he had ever been to. Um, more uh -huh. lawless than Alabama, more lawless than Mississippi. Right. Um, and right. so Dr. King said, this is it. He said, this is the place we need to be to make sure that we get this legislation passed in Congress. And sure enough, right. they caused so much hell in St. Augustine <laughs> that, <laughs> um, that John Johnson didn't have a choice but to sign the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Okay. So, okay. so people, don't, That's what's up. I don't think so. So to address your earlier statement, I don't think people really understand or know or have been taught the significance of what happened in Tallahassee and in Florida as a whole. And so, and, and we don't have, yeah, um, it, we don't have a statewide institution um, dedicated right. to. To telling that story, we have we have several um, African American museums uh, throughout Florida that exist to tell the story of African Americans and what took place in those uh, specific towns um, and, and and cities, but we don't have uh, something to to really tell the story um, holistically of what happened mm -hmm. in the state of Florida. So. Um, so that's a part of it. But 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 NAPAC as an organization, you know, we, we're committed to preserving the history. Um, there are mm. several um, like like like, for instance, uh, last year. Um, when I um, I had the opportunity to appear on a radio show with uh, I was invited by um, our mayor pro tem here in Tallahassee, uh, Commissioner Diane Williams Cox invited me to appear on a radio show. I appeared with uh, Mrs. Altamese Barnes, who founded the Riley House, uh -huh. and, uh -huh. um, and 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 there was a caller. There was a caller who asked us if we had ever heard of a cemetery for slaves existing at the capital city uh, country club, and 
I seem to, uh, and when 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 he said right. this, it brought it brought my mind back to seeing a newspaper article um, when I was doing some research from 2001. Miss um, uh -huh. Anita Davis, Miss Anita Davis was president of the NAACP, and uh, she had gotten with a city commissioner, uh, Dr. Charles Billings, who was in office at that time, to uh, research this. But uh, it it seemed like it didn't go anywhere at the time, so. Um, I thought it was important to bring that issue back up to the city right. and say, uh, you know, we need to do some uh, further research on this. But uh, long, long story short, um, the National Park Service ended up coming in and doing a, um, a GPR survey and found mm -hmm. that indeed um, those slaves are uh, in fact buried at the uh, Capital City Country Club. And so uh, so it's things like that. It's things like that. Right. Um, right is why is why NAPAC exists because we got to bring right. dignity to uh, those brothers and sisters that were buried at the Capital City Country Club. We got to bring dignity to um, a cemetery project that I actually just got involved in because um, there was a, a lady on my Facebook page that got in touch with me a few weeks ago, and she told me that there was a cemetery um, behind her house that was. Uh, uh, grown up and um, and so um, so hesitantly I agreed to go with it because I didn't know what was <laughs> was back. Then. Well, you know, <laughs> right. Uh, but but we um, in the Jake Gaither neighborhood uh, okay. between Spring Sex Park and Notre Dame Street, mm -hmm. uh, there are a bunch of trees and woods. But back yeah, up in those right, trees right. and woods are the graves of black folks that are over a hundred years old. Hold on, time out, time out, time, hold on, time out. Like, right. for real? Like, no, because I was just over there. No, like, seriously. And and the reason why, why you see the shot on my face is, uh, remember when we did the interviews with Miss Laura Dixie? You know, she oh, lives yeah. like, you can walk, you can walk from her house there, and I spent a lot of time over there because mm -hmm. I'm best friends with her grandson. And it's, so, it's I, so I, it's, it's literally across the street right, from Miss Dixon's right, house that, by that big ditch. Right, uh, be, be, across across the street from Miss Dixon's house, you see trees. Okay, mm -hmm. in those woods are marked graves. For wow. African Americans, the oldest, uh, the oldest of which the the most legible headstone is nineteen fourteen. Wow! So you have people who's who, and see those houses. A lot of those houses weren't even built until the nineteen fifties. The houses on Miss Dixie Street, which is I think is Tanner Drive, and then the houses. On Notre Dame Street, right. those houses weren't even built until the 1950s, and so this cemetery, which is associated with um, Fountain Chapel AME Church, um, had right. to, has to date back to the 1800s because Fountain Chapel AME Church was founded in 1880 in that area. So I'm quite certain that they started burying people in their cemetery shortly after the church was mm -hmm. founded. So you're talking about a cemetery that date back to the 1800s that's grown up right. with trees and woods that have headstones. The last burial took place, I think, in 1966. The earliest burial that we know of because of headstone evidence, 1914. And right. um, uh, that's the kind of stuff that's why I founded the organization right there. That's a perfect example. <laughs> that's a perfect example because it just shows how we as a community have been marginalized over the years um, and, and, and it shows how we, yeah. we are still being marginalized in many ways because we are, you know, because I see I mean, even my great great grandparents, my great great grandmother uh, specifically, um, her name was Mary Bell Isler. Um, she's buried in the old city cemetery uh, downtown mm -hmm. on uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. 
And uh-huh. but she's buried, she's buried in the black section in the back uh-huh. of the cemetery. I didn't know that had a black, I didn't know there was a black section. It's a black section of the old city cemetery in the back, and some of the most prominent black names in Tallahassee history are buried there. Nim, uh, Riley, um, mm-hmm. so, uh, N.B. Young, who was the longest serving and second president of Florida A&M University, he left Tallahassee to serve as president of the uh, HBCU Lincoln University, but he requested that he be right. buried in Tallahassee. He's buried there. Um, a lot of famous uh, African Americans uh, in Florida and Tallahassee are buried there, but, they, but the cemetery was segregated in um, in 1936, uh, the city commission voted not to <laughs> the city commission voted uh, voted not to uh, allow the burials of, of, of African Americans any longer in city cemeteries. Right. And so that forced uh, J.R.D. Laster and John G. Riley and other African American community leaders at the time to start their own cemetery, Greenwood Cemetery. Well, in the nineteen eighties, okay. in the nineteen eighties, when um, Dorothy Emmon Johnson was uh, serving as our uh, first African American female uh-huh. city commissioner and mayor, she was approached uh-huh. by some of our more prominent community leaders to 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 do something about the state of Greenwood Cemetery uh, at that time, and so the city. Uh, ended up taking over the maintenance of Greenwood Cemetery after the community uh-huh. got together and cleaned it up. So, right. so, so that was so that's an example um, of uh, an injustice that was done, but was later many years right. uh, corrected. So, so, so I got a question. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and this, um, it it gonna vary a bit, but. You talked about renaming Orange Avenue the CK Steel Highway. What was the what was the process uh, that took to get the highway renamed after CK Steel? And like, was it was it a lot of pushback uh, going through that process, or when you initiated um, having the 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 highway or the road renamed to CK Steel Highway? There was no pushback, um, but okay. there was there was nothing but support. But um, the thing about that is the 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 legislation because because Orange Avenue half of half of Orange Avenue from South Monroe Street to Capitol Circle Southwest is a state road, and because uh-huh. that and because that section is a state road, um, it had to go through the Florida legislature, and so uh, Representative. Or former state representative Alan Williams um, uh-huh. was was the one who 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 proposed that. We had a conversation and okay. he put it in. Um, he he termed out of the legislature in um, 2016. So uh, uh-huh. Ramon Alexander and State Senator Bill Mumford yeah, had to continue to push it because. Um, we could not get a transportation facility designation bill out of the House and Senate in 2015. Um, there uh-huh. was not one passed in 2017. Uh, and um, no, 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 I'm sorry, in 2016. And then in 2017, uh-huh. when they finally finally passed the transportation facility designations bill, it didn't include the CK Steel designation. And I was very disappointed. Because at that point, right. uh, we had been working for three years. And so in 2018, uh, Senator Mumford uh, put it put it back in there again. And um, thankfully, uh, Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 382 um, uh-huh. was signed by um, the governor um, on March 23rd, 2018. And so that's how we were able to get um, that state road Named in honor okay. to Reverend C.K. Steele. Um, now, Reverend okay. Steele's son, his son, who was still alive at the time, uh, Daryl Steele, um, also uh, former County Commissioner Bob Radcliffe, came to me 
and said that they thought that Reverend Steele really deserved, uh, you know, the entirety of the road. Um, uh -huh. So, so the other, so, so, so the other issue that we ran in at that time was, okay, we got the part of the road that's owned by the state of Florida named after four years of putting bills in. Um, now we got to see who owns the other part of that street. So, so Orange Avenue, South Monroe to South Blairstone is owned by Leon County and South Blairstone uh -huh. all the way out to Southwood Plantation Road is the city of Tallahassee. So, okay. the, so, so Leon County moved expeditiously, um, to, to designate their portion, and then the city moved expeditiously to designate their portion. So that's how that okay. came about. So, so, so really, it took right. uh, four years to get that done. Okay, okay. And for those who are, are not familiar with Tallahassee, it is a. We're talking about Orange Avenue, and Orange Avenue is one of the main roads on the south side of Tallahassee. Tallahassee is one of the most segregated cities as far as black and white in the United States. And we are literally, literally divided by railroad tracks. So everything on the north side of town basically is white people's side. And everything on the south side is black people's side. And Orange Avenue is a main road on the black side of town. So it was very important to have the road named after Reverend C.K. Steele. Now, I did a video on Reverend C.K. Steele here on this on the Stores of Jazz YouTube channel. So I encourage all of you all to go watch that video, like, comment, and subscribe. But Delatry, can you kind of can you give us more information on C.K. Steele, kind of some of the stories um, about C.K. Steele that that helped cement his legacy as a true freedom fighter? Sure. Um, well, Reverend Steele came from um, Bluefield, West Virginia. Um, and he started preaching really, 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 uh, early when he was about 15 years old, I believe. And, um, he went to Montgomery, Alabama. He went to various cities in Georgia, um, preaching and, um, he went to Morehouse college. He graduated from Morehouse college in 1938 with a bachelor of arts degree in religion. And uh, somewhere along the way, he met, uh, Dr. King, I believe, he met Dr. Uh -huh. King in Alabama when he was preaching in Alabama. I think uh -huh. uh, that's when they met. They became really, really close friends. And Reverend Steele um, was 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 quite actively involved um, in civil rights on a national level then. Um, so he he and Dr. King um, became close. And so uh, he eventually was called to pastor. Uh, uh, Bethel Missionary Baptist Church in 19 yeah yeah Bethel Missionary Baptist Church in 1952 um and at the time it was on Boulevard Street um in 1952 mm -hmm. uh the church had a uh, a parsonage and um in fact Bethel Missionary Baptist Church is the oldest African American church in Leon County and so he came to okay. pastor that church in 1952 uh, his first order of business when he came to Tallahassee in 1952 was to was to get Tallahassee his first black police officer, which he was able mm -hmm. to do successfully that same year right. with uh, working with Reverend Dr. James Hudson and Father David Brooks, who uh, pastored uh, St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church and also the Reverend Dan Speed. Um, so they they went they they worked to get Tallahassee his first black police officer. Subsequently. Um, working with Dr. King um, on the Montgomery bus boycott um, and doing a lot of uh, a lot of traveling, um, a lot a lot mm -hmm. of the most mm -hmm. a lot of the most important civil rights events that people know about all over the country. C.K. Steele was there, but C.K. Steele right. was not. He was not a clout chaser or a camera chaser. So a lot of times when you see Reverend Steele in the pictures with Dr. King, uh, he either is, um, you know, looking looking over somewhere, or 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 his his right. head is his head is peeking out from behind somewhere, because because even though he was on that bridge in Selma, and even though he was at the march on Washington, and even though he was in uh, St. Augustine, um, he he wasn't necessarily trying to be seen. He was trying to fight for 
um, the call. So right. even though even though right. he was there when you when you did catch him, um, you know he was he was he was picking out from somewhere. But um, <laughs> so, so 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 the success of Montgomery in 1955, uh, and the arrest of the two FAMU students in 1956, uh, Reverend Steele decided to uh, well actually. The ministers, the black ministers in Tallahassee um, asked him to serve as president of the Intercivic Council. The reason they started the Intercivic Council as the organization that would lead the Tallahassee bus boycott is because Alabama and Florida were trying to uh, outlaw the NAACP in their respective mm -hmm. state as an organization because uh members of the Florida legislature and Alabama legislature at the time uh, said that the NAACP was sending people into their respective communities to be troublemakers. So they started right. an organization of their own made up of local people, the Intercivic Council, that would lead the efforts mm -hmm. of the bus boycott. Um, now, the bus boycott was um, a turbulent time for Tallahassee. Um, but eventually, um, there, there were some, some riots that were averted. Um, there, there was a planned, um, uh, protest downtown mm -hmm. in 1956 to, to test, uh, bus segregation that was called off because there was, there were a group of, uh, whites downtown who, who had, um, hammers, uh, hidden in brown paper bags and, um, they had planned to start a riot. And so Governor uh, Leroy Collins at the time uh, suspended bus service in Tallahassee. Uh, significant, I think, is when you watch video from that time period, there is mm -hmm. there, there is there is a building um, bus. The buses at that time were um, they, they were privately. It was a private company called Cities Transit Incorporated. Cities Transit, okay. um, the, the, the building um, that Cities Transit was located in uh, where they parked all the buses is actually still standing um, in uh, Cascades Park. Uh, it was actually across mm -hmm. the street from, from our local jail. Um, but, right. but, but he suspended bus service for a time. Uh, but when it resumed, um, there was a ruling that was issued by a federal judge out of Miami um, to desegregate buses and so when Reverend C.K. Steele and uh, the Reverend A.C. Red, uh, Reverend H. McNeil Harris, who was pastor of uh, Bethel AME Church at the time, um, they they got on the bus and to test the bus segregation. Um, and sure enough, uh, the the buses had been been integrated, but but that was just the mm -hmm. start of things. And so right. so Reverend Steele continued to. Uh, work for civil rights uh, nationally, but also here at home. He would host people um, in his parsonage like um, Constance Baker Motley uh, and Thurgood Marshall, who were the NAACP attorneys. And of course, they were instrumental in uh, integrating many of the uh, universities throughout the South and um, right. m m many other things. And of course, um, I think in 1961 or so, uh, Reverend Steele had invited Dr. King to Tallahassee because 1960, 1961 was during the time we had student sit-ins. And actually, um, mm -hmm. uh, Reverend, Reverend Steele took on the role of an, of an advisor uh, when the student sit-ins started in 1960 because they were being led right. really by the, by the students who were leading right. the core chapter here in Tallahassee, the Congress of Racial Equality. And so so he would go downtown to advise the students, but he would also be participating in the sit ins and in the pickets, carrying mm -hmm. the pickets, okay. picket signs and the protest signs downtown. Um, and um, if the students got arrested, they would they would take they would bring food to the jail um, and in and, 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 and that kind of uh, thing. Um, but he, he also continued to be active nationally. Um, there mm -hmm. were, there was a group that got arrested in 1961 during the freedom riots called the Tallahassee 10. The Tallahassee 10 were a group of ministers who came to Tallahassee from all over the country to try and integrate the Tallahassee airport. When they did so, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were arrested 
Um, but for some reason, the, the trial went all the way up to 1964. Uh, right. And uh, they, they actually returned to Tallahassee in 1964 to 10 ministers to serve out their jail sentences. Um, but they ended up only serving a, a few days before they were released. Um, but Reverend Steele, uh, Freedom Rise, um, uh, integrate, integrate in the airport. Um, he, one of his children actually, um, he filed a lawsuit uh, against the Leon uh-huh. County School Board because Brown versus Board had happened in 1954. So Reverend Steele was the one right. who filed the lawsuit here in Leon County um, to desegregate um, our local school system, which really started taking place uh, between 1964 and 1965. Um, uh-huh. Also, he was instrumental in um the voting rights um movement um traveling to alabama um traveling to dc and different other places to so that he could participate because he was serving as the executive vice president of the southern christian leadership conference um right. which which dr king was president of and so with dr Steele being executive vice president that kept him out of town often on business um so but 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 the the civil rights movement that was fought here in Tallahassee was largely done so uh, under the leadership of uh, Reverend Steele and uh, the Reverend R. N. Gooden. Um, certainly, as right. you move into uh, the 1970s, um, they continue to 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 fight because a lot of iniquities um, con- continue, uh-huh. um, you know, past the 60s, past the Passed the Civil right. Rights Act, passed the Voting Rights Act, passed the Fair Housing Act of um, 1968. Um, so, right. and he he the the last battle he fought was getting uh, Boulevard Street renamed to uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And uh, okay. when they did it, when they did it the first time, it was done from uh, Brevard Street to through the FAMU campus. Because the other side, okay. um, the other side of the street would not be renamed until the 1990s because uh, that that part of the community was not interested at that time in having um, a Boulevard Street named for Dr. King. So um, so at the time, Reverend Steele said, we'll come back uh, next year and we'll and, and, and we'll get the other uh-huh. half of it but before that could happen. He passed away. So that happened in April right. of 1980. Um, okay. but, but he fought, but he fought many, many battles here in Tallahassee, filed many lawsuits, participated in many, uh, sit-ins and marches and acts of protest. Um, even, even when he got really, really sick with the, uh, bone marrow cancer, um, you know, mm-hmm. he would still, he would still march, uh, with his cane and he would, um, and he would get up on Sundays at his church and he would preach, um, and um, he, he was he was just really an extraordinary and humble um, uh, servant and uh, extraordinary uh, civil rights icon. Um, right. N- not just for us, but for the entire country. For the nation. Yeah. 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 And, and and that's why that's why I want more people to know about Reverend C.K. Steele, because he contributed greatly to black America. Like he was a real frontline fighter. He wasn't like, like a lot of people today, just, of course it wasn't available back then, but we have a lot of keyboard warriors today, but, um, that Reverend, Reverend Steele was out there in the trenches. And, um, I just, I think that more people should know about him and what he brought to the table because, Mm -hmm. uh, because of his relationship with Dr. King and Dr. King spent a lot of time in Tallahassee as well. Um, so, so, and it, it was, we, we didn't learn anything about that. Like I say, um, when Dr. King came to Tallahassee and I learned this from you, when Dr. King came to Tallahassee, he would oftentimes stay with, uh, Miss Laura Dixie, and Mr. Sam Dixie, mm-hmm. he would stay with them. Right. And those are the grandparents of my best friend. And it's crazy because I've been around this man since the first grade and had no idea, had no idea of like the richness of the, of the history, even in his family in Tallahassee. So, and, and that's why, to me, that's why conversations like this is important, understanding and preserving uh, black history. So I wanna, 
I want to get into, in, in the spirit of the preservation of Black history, I want to get into to educate people about Frenchtown and um, uh, I don't, not Seneca Village, but Smoky Hollow, which is now Cascade Park. But before I get into that, people don't know about, you mentioned Reverend Aaron Good. You mentioned him. Now, we've had conversations about him. You told me wonderful things about him. But can you tell, uh, educate our listeners a little more about Reverend Aaron Good? Because he was another uh, important pillar in Tallahassee community. Well, uh, I remember the conversation that, that me and you had with Miss Dixie about Reverend Good. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, it, it makes me smile because um, Reverend Good was a mentee of Reverend Steele and they worked very, mm -hmm. very closely together uh, in the 60s and the 70s on the issues that were going on with within the uh, civil rights movement also with the uh, SCLC and the uh, and the NAACP, but but Reverend Gooden um, Reverend Gooden said himself in his own words. He said um, CK um, was played the moderate role, uh, but I was not a moderate. Um, <laughs> and, and he said he said we needed CK and we needed me too. Um, in fact, right. uh, he said that shortly before he. Um, passed away he but Reverend Gooden was more of a uh he was more confrontational in his approach and um and mm -hmm. and, and, and uh he um I remember some of our local uh leaders saying that he was a tell it like it is kind of uh person um and 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 mm -hmm. he and, and and because people knew that he was sincere um now his style, be, be, because his style was a bit more confrontational, um, uh -huh. he was not always successful. But but people knew that he was sincere, and they knew that right. if Reverend Gooden was involved in an issue, that a fight was definitely on. Um, but right. he um, he came to Tallahassee in 1961 to uh, serve as pastor of uh, Saint Mary Primitive Baptist Church, which is at um, 454 West Call Street, and actually, uh -huh. um, he came when that that was a wooden church. He he actually built um, the structure that's there now, the brick church. And um, okay, Reverend, Reverend Steele and Reverend Gooden, you know, they were just different um, civil rights leaders who we um, had at that time. You know, when when people would come from out of town to participate in civil rights marches and protests, um, a lot of times they would sleep. At Reverend Steele and Reverend Gooden's house, they would sleep. Uh -huh. um, they would sleep in the church, um, on the pews. Um, you know, you don't you don't see that kind of stuff happening um, now, even though it needs to be right. happening. Now. Right. Um, you know, they, they they would they would allow people to to come in and uh, sleep in the church, and um, that they would have uh, food. The community would come and bring food and all that, all that kind of stuff. But um, 1961. Um, Reverend Gooden was, uh, he started out in Tallahassee as president of the NAACP uh, Youth Council. Mm -hmm. He was advisor for the uh, the Youth Council. And slowly but surely, he got involved with every major civil rights organization in the South, um, whether it be NAACP, whether That's it be good. Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He was able to prove um, his, his leadership skills and ability. Um, he was able to work with even in the 1960s. Um, he was able to work with mm -hmm. uh, Governor Claude Kirk, um, and uh, actually, um, if you if you go back and look at the newspaper articles that were published during that time, I credit Reverend R. N. Gooden with the state of Florida receiving its first black judges and its first black Supreme okay. Court justice. Because Reverend Gooden was, I mean, he was outspoken. And Governor Reuben Askew, um, who who I'm a, I'm a big fan of Governor Askew because so many uh, gains uh, of African Americans were, were made during his tenure. But Reverend Gooden was on him hard. Um, <laughs> there, 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 there are no, there, there, there are no black. There's not enough black police officers. There are no black judges. We don't have enough black uh, elected officials. We don't have enough black people 
uh, in state government? When we gonna get uh, our, our, our black judge? We gonna get this? We gonna get that? And so, mm. um, I mean, literally months after his 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 uh, public press conferences and statements and uh, meetings with the governor, we got our first black uh, Supreme Court justice in uh, Justice right. Joseph W. Hatcher. And uh, okay. we got the first, our first black judge um, in Orange County and other places. And Dr. Doris Austin um, was was appointed to the Leon County School Board, first black school board member. Um, we started getting um, black folks in, in in state government and on school boards, on city councils, um, all, all throughout the state. And so, mm -hmm. Reverend Gooden, Reverend Goodness, to be credited. Um and, okay. and, and that's that that's that's a part of the public record. Uh that you know anybody right. can go and and look this up. He 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 is to be credited with forcefully ensuring um that we got African Americans in state government uh in the state of Florida. Okay. And that's now good. let me tell you now let me tell you about Pensacola. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Good was born in Milton, Florida, which is about 30 right. minutes or so away from, from Pensacola. Right, Right. And 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 he worked with at the time I think from from 1970 to 1975 Reverend Gooden was the uh, field director for the Florida uh, State Conference the NAACP branches and so Pensacola was still rigidly segregated and so the Reverend H K Matthews who's still alive he's in his 90s and he is still out marching he was out there with <laughs> That's the good. Guys, not a, he was with the Black Lives Matter protesters with his mask on, sitting in his wheelchair, uh, with a megaphone, uh -huh. uh, still, still marching at I think ninety three years old, um, which I think I think Reverend Gooden would have been ninety three years old if he was still alive. He was in, um, they were in Pensacola. There was a young black man, um, Wendell, Wendell Blackwell, or Wendell Johnson, something like that, one or the other, who had been murdered, um, and. By the, uh, by uh, I think it was by police, and Reverend Gooden and uh, Reverend uh, Matthews, um, they led thousands. Um, in fact, there are uh -huh. two separate books. It's two separate books that that were written on this because what Gooden and Matthews did in Pensacola was so significant because, you know, here we are. We had had all these laws passed and everything, and th th there were still active efforts to. Uh, prevent people from voting, um, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of a lot of stuff going on in Pensacola. So, so Reverend Gooden and Matthews, I mean, they 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 filled up the jails. Um, they right. had mass meetings. They had marches, um, and did uh, everything they possibly could to. Uh, I think uh, Reverend Matthews ended up ended up going to prison um, because mm -hmm. they said he had, said he had threatened. Um, the sheriff with some chant that they were doing in the church um, down there, but they camped out on the governor's lawn. Um, I mean, they did they did they did a lot in right. Pensacola. Uh, Re Reverend Gooden and they and in fact, the NAACP um, said that Gooden was too radical. Um, said that um, wow. said that they wanted him to focus more on um having meetings and and negotiating uh then on then on protesting and so he resigned uh from the NAACP right. and uh the Reverend Ralph Abernathy who succeeded Dr. King as president of the SCLC appointed Reverend Gooden as president of the Florida SCLC and so he continued okay. his civil rights work in Pensacola under the auspices of the SCLC, and actually, Reverend Gooden mm -hmm. would re re remain as president of the state uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, as well as the Tallahassee chapter, until he died in 2002. But throughout the 1970s, um, Gooden was responsible for uh, additional uh, black principals in the Leon County school system. Mm -hmm. He was responsible mm -hmm. for black black teachers being hired. Um, and he really was a watchdog uh, for the African American community. If there was an injustice, if you called him on the phone in the middle of the night, he was he was he was there. If there was a if, if somebody had complained, 
um, that something happened, you know, he was he was there. There there was p- people in the community knew who to call when they needed an advocate. Right. And, and that person was right. for for 41 years in Tallahassee. That person was the Reverend Arian Gooden, um, whether he was needed uh, to help um, a, a, a black mother who 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 was dealing with her uh, child having been slapped by uh, a white coach. Um, wh- whether it was um, some someone who who had been raped, whether it was uh, an, an injustice wow. uh, going on in the uh, police department, whatever it was, um, he was he 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 battled he battled every injustice that he saw, uh, and right. and that that and, and of course that annoyed a lot of people, uh, but that's what made him unique. Um, he he that's battled good. every. Every, every injustice that he saw, um, he 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 battled it. Every single right. one, he was relentless. That's he good. was fearless. that's good. He, he didn't have he didn't have any fear at all. Reverend Gooden told you like it was, and he didn't think twice about it. So see, um, go ahead. Yeah, now I'm just gonna say, people like Reverend Gooden aren't taught. Um, like I when um me and my guest last week we were talking. And we're reiterating it now. Um, black resistance, black uprising, black people fighting back is not taught. We have always, always fought back in some shape, form, fashion. Um, I, I know that the the docile nature of black folk or the black folk who chose to try to be nice with and friends with white people, those are the ones that are showed to us and we're talked about most of the time. But I'll keep encouraging people, study your own history, study our history. The, the further you dig deep, you will see that people like Reverend Gooden existed everywhere. Black people always fought back. And that's the that's one of the reasons why preserving and teaching black history is important. It's on us to tell our stories. That's why I exist. That's why the Latry exists. Like that's that's real because Reverend Gooden was a bad man. And oh yeah. <laughs> and like he like growing up, like knew nothing about him. knew nothing about him. We only knew about the, the the pastors who were active and alive at that point, but knew nothing about Reverend Good. So, so um, two spots in Tallahassee. Gentrification has ramshacked Tallahassee. Like it's a small city. Um, at our height, we could have three hundred thousand people, and that's that's because of college students. We have FAMU and FSU, Florida State University, Florida A and M University, and we have Tallahassee mm-hmm. Community College. We have a huge, uh, have a huge college population in Tallahassee. Um, but Tallahassee, like I say, it's a it's a real black and white city. Uh, now, one of the anomalies on the because uh, we have a uh, street called Tennessee Street and we have railroad tracks on a street called Gang Street. And that's the, the divide from the north and the south side. Um, mm-hmm. On the north side, there was a historic black community called Frenchtown. And on the south side, there was a historic black community that's been wiped out and that's now a park. It was called Smoky Hollow. So mm-hmm. which one existed first? Frenchtown is the oldest uh, black neighborhood in the state of Florida. So Frenchtown existed first. Okay. Okay. So get, let's let's uh, go into the history of Frenchtown because um, I know it didn't start off exactly as you know the black uh, black part of town or black neighborhood. But let's get the the history of Frenchtown and how it became a black neighborhood and then how it became what it is now a gentrified community. Well, Frenchtown. Um, started out in 1824 it was settled originally by uh, the french um who 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 had come to tallahassee and when they moved out and um after the civil war in 1865 um freed slaves um settled into french town and those freed slaves um very against insurmountable seeming seemingly insurmountable odds they built their own homes um they started their own businesses um and so mm-hmm. every single thing so 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 with african americans being um shut out of other places um 
they didn't need to patronize uh, other areas because we had our own um, in in Frenchtown. Frenchtown was like a city in itself because everything that you needed was right there. There was right. there were there were hotels and boarding houses. There were nightclubs and restaurants. There were grocery stores and and shoe stores and jewelry stop jewelry, jewelry shops. There were uh, schools and churches. Um, uh, everything that you could think of, uh, movie theaters. Everything that you can think of, barber shops, um, hair salons, um, a mm. pharmacy, a hospital. Um, is it all, all of it was in Frenchtown? Right between on Macomb Street, between Tennessee Street and Brevard Street, on mm -hmm. those blocks, mm -hmm. you had every single thing that you would need to have, and and and, and African Americans did not have a, have a need to to leave um, Frenchtown, which is why it was called the heart of the black community for so long. And uh, I would say the late. The late '60s and early '70s um, started the decline of Frenchtown. The late '70s and early '80s is when you had a lot of the um, historic buildings in Frenchtown that were demolished, like the Redbird Cafe and the Laura Bell Memorial right. Hospital and um, the Chicken Shack, the Pool Hall. All these places that were so near and dear to the community. Yeah. Uh, were all uh, torn down and demolished in the 70s and the 80s. Um, when I mean, even even Reverend C.K. Steele's church uh, and parsonage um, on uh, at the corner of uh, MLK and Tennessee Street, all that was torn down mm -hmm. in the 70s to make way for the new churches there now. And I and and I right. don't think that we I don't think we realized as a community. In the 70s and the 80s, when all this was going on, I don't think that we realized um, how we were erasing so much of our history at the time. Um, uh -huh. and, 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 and today, um, you see a lot of gentrification that's taking place in Frenchtown. Like you see the, the student housing and um, other, um, the, the, these, yeah, monsters, I hate monsters, that. yeah the, the, these monstrous <laughs> developments that, have uh yeah you know have popped up um as you drive through Frenchtown and so when you I mean my 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 great great grandparents built a house in the 1920s on Virginia Street and mm -hmm. um my my great great grandmother's estate still owns um that vacant piece of land um right behind the Renaissance Center and so so it hits me different uh, then it might hit some some other people because, you know, I I ride through Frenchtown and I think about think about my great great grandparents and I think about my grandmother, who was a nurse at the Florida A and M University Hospital and um, uh -huh. she was she was trained in a um, LPN class at Lincoln High School and uh, eventually. She got uh, additional education and ended up being a supervisor of nurses. Uh, but but when they when they closed down the uh, Florida A&M Hospital, she ended up moving to um, Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. And so so I th and then my um, my great grand aunt, who was a uh, she was a a teacher at the many of the small uh, one room schoolhouses for blacks that were in the county. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a nurse at the Laura Bell Memorial Hospital. And uh, so so I think about my legacy and, and my family when I drive through Frenchtown and when I see that um, there's there's not much left. Um, it, it, yeah. it makes yeah. it makes me sad. But th there are a lot of Places that are still left, like, and I'm and I'm gonna point a few of them out, like um, the Tooks Hotel on Virginia Street. Um, mm -hmm. When you when you had many of the uh, the famous black entertainers that would come, uh, like Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong, uh, Lena Horne, James Brown, um, all, all of them would Ray stay Charles. at the Ray Charles. Ray Charles lived in Frenchtown actually between 1940 and 1945. 
So he Ray from, Charles, right? Because he is from Greenville. Yeah, right. he is from Greenville. Right. Well, that's what well, that's forty five minutes up, up the street. That's right. And 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 many people don't know Ray Charles lived in Tallahassee. Um, mm. you know that is in um. Uh, the the Taylor House, which goes back to 1894, which was the birth home of Miss Aquilina Howell, um, the Working Women's Band House, uh, which dates back to 1920s, um, the uh, the the Getty Speed Store. It's like one of the yeah. Um, I think it's the last remaining uh, wooden storefront in Frenchtown. Um, the yep. uh, the modern cleaners that was uh, the, which is where the yep. NAACP um, is housed now. So so there are a few properties left, um, and the original Lincoln High School, also which yes. was the only black high school for blacks in Leon County um, for a long right. time. So 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 there are several properties left um, that that we still have to to still tell somewhat of the story, but. I would I would definitely love it if we had um, the whole community still standing where we could tell that exactly. story. I, I, I would be exactly. very happy. With it. But but see, then yeah. it becomes incumbent upon us. It becomes incumbent yeah. upon yeah. us because 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 it's no longer there. We got to keep the story right. alive. We got to tell the story. We, do. we have to create. We have to write the books. We have to create institutions. We got to make the documentaries. We got to make the movies. We got to involve the people that need to be involved. We got to teach the kids. We got to, you know, that that's our responsibility. Right now, and what's what's interesting though, as you describe in Frenchtown, it was Tallahassee's black. It was I would say probably yeah, Tallahassee's Black Wall Street. And a lot of people, I encourage everybody do the do the history on your city, the black history on your city. Because I know we 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 romanticize Tulsa and Tulsa does deserve its due. But there were a lot of communities around the country and probably in your own backyard that was a booming community. It's on Black Wall Street. So do your research and make sure you get into that. So now the next is the next community is called Smoky Hollow. And mm -hmm. one of the most famous people to come out of Smoky Hollow was Wally Famous Amos. And, um, you know, the guy who invented the famous Amos Cookies, he's he's from Tallahassee, Florida, and he lived in the Smoky Hollow community. Um, Smoky Hollow is now literally a park like they knocked it down and it's a park. And then they they did a they did their their um, I guess you can say they preservation, their small preservation or display of the of some of the history of, of Smoky Hollow. But break, get, let's go into Smoky Hollow. Like, what was Smoky Hollow? How did it come about, and how did the gentrification happen? Well, Smoky Hollow, um, it, it it dates back um, quite a ways as well to the 1800s, it, and it got its name uh, because of the smoke that would come up from the small shotgun houses um, that were located there, and the smoke would come up mm -hmm. uh, because people were cooking. And there were actually some very prominent uh, families to come out of Smoky Hollow as well. Um, Lucille Holiday Brown, um, who passed away not too long ago, she was the first black librarian um, in Leon mm -hmm. County. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned Wally Amos. Um, there were some some other well known people in Smoky Hollow. Probably the most prominent of which was uh, John G. Riley. And actually, he owned mm -hmm. some property mm -hmm. in Smoky Hollow that he rented out to some of the African American families there. Um it's a there's a um like you mentioned the memorial that's there, but an a actual piece of Smoky Hollow that was actually put back into Cascades Park is the, the barbershop. Um the small right. barbershop that's that's there that people can come in and and visit. So um, the where the Department of Transportation building is now, um, that was Smoky Hollow. Now, uh, despite the fact that most of it is gone, Smoky Hollow is a National Historic District. And if you drive up Lafayette Street behind mm. the Department of Transportation building, there are some small shotgun houses, maybe right. three or four small shotgun houses that are still um, existing from Smoky Hollow. Um, so so the so the community was not completely 
completely annihilated. Most of it was in the name of urban renewal in the 1960s. Um, and, and a similar uh, community that faced uh, a similar fate, urban renewal fate, was a community called uh, Rat Row. Rat Row was what a black was community. Row? I've heard of Rat Row. That was a black community um, located where the Civic Center is now. Where the, okay. where the civic center where the civic center is now and on uh, that parking lot there was an entire wow. African American community there that wow. that was a whole that was a whole African American community that was um destroyed in the name of urban renewal in the urban in the early uh 70s um so you you got Smoky Hollow you got Rat Row uh French Town um and um I mean, uh, in in North Tallahassee, off Thomasville Road, you had Carol's Quarters, uh, was a, a small black enclave there. Um, m many many other areas in Tallahassee that deserve uh, uh -huh. mentioning. And and when you see these black cemeteries, when you see these black these 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 cent century old black cemeteries, uh -huh. either either there was a slave plantation nearby, or there was a black community nearby. Um and out out Mayhan Drive, uh, there's a cemetery, um Monree, Mon Monree Cemetery, and um then you have a uh, another one by the name of Hickory Hill, um out out at out at Walani, uh Walani Plantation that's being developed right now, that was a historic uh black community and there are a few cemeteries out there as a matter of fact, uh, containing uh, the bodies of black people. So really all right. over, um, out in the county, in the city, everywhere, you had these um, these black communities that were significant and that were destroyed. But like I said, we it's up to us to um, preserve that history. Right, right. Um, I want to the last thing I want to get to is is the importance of FAMU and how FAMU played a significant part in just the history of Tallahassee and just North Florida and the South. Um, but how familiar are you with the history of the Union Bank that's on Appalachia Parkway? Well, the Union Bank um, goes all the way back to the 1830s or the 1840s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and mm -hmm. ap after slavery, it was Freedman's Bank. Um, and so a lot of free slaves um, used it. It was it was a bank. It was a it was a it was a grocery store. Um, it was a it was a, a, a salon, I believe, at one point. Um, and it was moved uh, to its current location on Appalachia Parkway from Park Avenue. Uh, it's an extremely significant um, historic building that we still have standing in, in um, Tallahassee. Um, it's owned by the state of Florida. It's been in use by the Black Archives since the 1980s. Uh -huh. um, and James Eaton, who was a uh, professor of history at Florida A&M University, um, he was instrumental in acquiring the Union Bank um, because of its historic significance to African Americans. Uh, he was he was instrumental in acquiring it uh, so that the Black Archives could alleviate some of its space constraints that it was experiencing at the time. Um, but right. Union Bank. Uh, or, or Freedman's Bank um, is, 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 is extremely significant and, and it's one of the oldest surviving buildings um, that we still have in Tallahassee. Right, okay. Yeah, um, I know um, I we had an event there. That was one of our main hubs and main events for um, Black History Month because you know, I'm on the advisory board for the Black History Month Festival. And we we use it a lot. So shout out to um, that he gonna kill me. It, I'm I'm looking at his face. Um, Dr. Matt Ewan, yeah, All right, Dr. Matt Ewan. I don't know his name. His face was right there. But shout out to Dr. Matt Ewan for keeping um, keeping the Black history going with the Black Archives and with the Union Bank. So so FAMU, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, is a historic. Uh, university. It's a you know, like you mentioned earlier, a lot of the FAMU students have been involved in a lot of the civil rights movements and things that have happened in Tallahassee. 
you mentioned uh, Jake, Jackson Patterson. There's a street name that both of those ladies uh, off of FAMU campus. But what? How significant was FAMU to like the Black history of Tallahassee and the Black history of like North Florida or Florida period? Well, FAMU came out of a bill that was filed in 1885 by Thomas Van Gibbs, who was a Reconstruction era Reconstruction era uh, state legislator out of Jacksonville. Um, he was uh, the son of Jonathan uh, Gibbs who was the first black secretary of state of Florida in the 1860s uh, following uh -huh. uh, slavery, following um, slavery. And um, Thomas Van Gibbs, who, because of the uh, Jim Crow laws that were put in place in the 1890s, um, that ended his legislative career. But while he was still in the legislature, uh, he filed this bill that, that created a white institution and that created a black institution, the University of Florida okay. and Florida a and University. Um, it okay. was supposed to be located in Jacksonville originally, and right. Gibbs was supposed to serve as the president, but they ended up putting it in the state capital of Tallahassee and um, on a former plantation that was owned by mm -hmm. uh, former Governor um, William Pope Duval, and um, he became the vice president. Interestingly enough, uh, Thomas Van Gibbs's house is still standing on FAMU's campus. It's the oldest mm -hmm. wooden structure still remaining uh, on FAMU's campus. In fact, Gibbs Cottage is older um, than the Carnegie Library, uh, which is where the Black wow. Archive is located. So I right. think the Carnegie Library is um, dates back to 1909. Gibbs Cottage dates mm -hmm. back to 1892. Um, okay. And give is one of the many uh, historic African American properties that needs to be restored um, and open to the public. You know, currently Gibbs Cottage, um, as as old and as historically significant as it is, being the home of the founder of the university, is mm. sitting sitting on campus, boarded up and unused, and and has been for quite some time since the 1990s. Um, but but that that's an that, that's an example of another property that we have to uh, restore. Uh, but Florida A and M University has been significant to the state of Florida as a whole. Many um, African Americans who went on to make contributions in Miami and Jacksonville and Tampa and other places throughout Florida all graduated from Florida A and M University. Um, uh -huh. uh, a, a a significant amount of them and. Fam, you had the most socially conscious student body in America, and in many ways, that has continued to be the case. Um, e e even, even, even in in modern times, that's continued to be the mm -hmm. case. Um, the student sit-in movement, as I mentioned earlier, um, the FAMU students were the first to go to jail and refuse to pay fines during the uh, sit-in movement. They were they 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 are the ones who who voted um, to to boycott buses and when, when their students were arrested and they had a mass meeting in Lee Hall where they all voted to boycott buses. And when the next bus came through campus, um, they got on that bus and told their students to get off and then they rocked the bus and overturned it. So uh, that's a significant. <laughs> so that's hey, got, um, got <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, and, you know, uh, uh, Brodus Hartley, who was student body president at the time, and Dr. Frederick uh, Humphreys, who was president, who uh, became president many years later. But he was a student at that time. They all uh, tell that story often about how the football players turned the bus over when it came through campus. Um, but right. but FAMU has produced um, some of the most uh, significant uh, blacks in the country. Um, Congresswoman Carrie Meek, who was born in Tallahassee, but eventually went on to be elected to the Florida legislature as the um, first African-American female uh, senator for the state of Florida and eventually the first black Congress person from Florida since Reconstruction. Um, she's a Tallahassean. 
um, even though she was elected from Miami and she's a FAMU graduate. Um, she went on to work with Mayor McLeod with Thune and other people. Congresswoman Meek right. is um, she's still alive in Miami. Um, okay. Born in born in 1926 in Tallahassee in a section of Tallahassee that was referred to as the Black Bottom. Uh, that off of Bruno Street, right off of FAMU's campus. Uh, in fact, they mm-hmm. just placed a historic marker there. Uh, right before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened, there was a marker, a historic marker put in the ground to recognize Carrie Meek's uh, parents, uh, the Pittmans, right. who, who ran a boarding house uh, right there off of campus. Um, and FAMU was surrounded by those black communities. Um, the the FAMU Way extension, um, that 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 um there were two significant black communities that um were uh in the way of that family way extension that was um Stearns uh-huh. Mosley Stearns Mosley community um and the Boynton Steel community um the Stearns Mosley workers as well as the Boynton Steel community that they were workers uh from the Alberta crate factory so those were African Americans uh-huh. who worked at the factory and then they built um, they built their homes in these communities on the outskirts of FAMU's um, campus. And then Bond, Bond uh, is also a very um, sig- historically significant community in Tallahassee. Right. Um, right. Bond was home to the Reverend King Solomon Dupont, who was one of the civil rights leaders and uh, boy- bus boycott participants. He was the first black person to run for the Tallahassee City Commission in 1957 and he was pastor of Fountain Chapel Amy Church. His house is still standing um, though it, though it's boarded up. It's in danger of being demolished but his house is still standing on um, Distant Street and there were many businesses uh-huh. on wash houses. Um, Mr. Robert Perkins so Robert Perkins Sr. Um, he was uh, he owned um, a, a gas station on, on South Adams Street, I believe it was, and he would fill up the the cars of the um, the carpool participants who were participating in the boycott. He would right. fill up those cars right. with gas, and um, also uh, he filed many um, anti discrimination lawsuits in Leon County. Um, right, and I think he worked he worked at Florida A and M for a time. But there are many significant okay. people um, at Florida A and M who were involved in civil rights such as Dr. Charles U. Smith, um, Miss Daisy Young. Daisy Young, well, she was a firebrand. She worked at FAMU, um, but the students were becoming so involved in civil rights that the legislature put pressure on the president, Dr. George uh-huh. W. Gordon, to, to expel students who participated, which he did. And um, that's one of the reasons it took Patricia Stevens do eight years to earn her college degree. Um, she 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 started at FAMU in 1957, but she didn't graduate until 1965 because uh, because she you know she was protesting. She was going to jail for the cause, and so, mm-hmm. uh, so she was she was expelled for a time. But she did eventually earn her degree. Um, and and, and many, there were many other students who were expelled, but eventually earned degrees. Um, so FAMU was significant in the development of black communities. Right. In the 1920s and 1930s, um, and the university itself um, has gone through many significant changes. There have been many um, distinguished presidents, each of whom have had their um, issues individually. Um, with it being a state school, you know, you have to get funding from the legislature. You have to work with right. uh, the legislature and the governor and other people. So. Uh, it's 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 been a difficult 130 years um, for 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 a variety of reasons, but um, FAMU continues to rise, continues to move forward. Um, but it's it, it's extremely significant for a variety of reasons. A lot of yeah. which I probably yeah. I probably won't get a chance to go into. But um, <laughs> FAMU has been significant to the development of Black Florida. Um, as a whole, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, we definitely you, we, we had Coach Alonzo uh, Jake Gaither, who uh, was the yep. famous, bla- yep. most famous black coach in America. Um, he would hold his coaching clinics in Tallahassee and black coaches and white coaches. Yep. Would come. 
yeah. to to learn. Yeah, Bobby Brown from didn't learn from him. Absolutely. Yeah. And they would tell you that. Um, Bear Bryant, yep. all these all these famous coaches, they came to learn from Coach Gaither. Um, so yeah. uh, and and I know I'm I know I'm forgetting some stuff because there's so much when you it's talk about good. Florida yeah. but oh let's but um yeah. the the hospital because mm-hmm. what's interesting and what's funny growing up older black people tell us were always like you you know I was born at fam you and as a child you like what that you know I, I was thinking that that meant that fam you was born in them like they were mm-hmm. real big like stout supporters of fam you I, I didn't know that they were literally saying no I was literally born at fam you because the fam you hospital was the black mm-hmm. hospital at the time so can you go more into that sure that hospital started in 1911 it was a wooden building at first um, the current building, which is the, now the Foot Hill Administration Center, mm-hmm. um, that, the construction of that, excuse me, construction of that building is to be credited um, to uh, President William H. Gray Jr. and Dr. Uh, Leonard H. B. Foot, who was the medical director right. for the family uh, hospital, and so I, it, it was dedicated in 1949. The brick building is there now. But it was the only mm-hmm. hospital within a 150 mile radius, uh, the only uh, the only publicly owned uh, black hospital uh, that would treat African Americans. So that so it was significant to Tallahassee and surrounding areas. Everything right. that they do um, at, at any other hospital uh, w- was done at the FAMU hospital because really that was our only option. The Laura Bell Memorial Hospital in Frenchtown um, was closed in 1956, I believe it was, after Dr. Campbell went to prison. Uh, he was accused of doing a botched abortion on a white woman. And right. he said he said that he did not do perform the abortion, but but rather he was trying to fix another doctor's uh, work. And so he was uh-huh. he was in prison. He was in prison and ended up dying in uh uh he was released eventually in uh he passed in the 70s um but so 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 after that hospital was phased out the famu hospital was the only one for the next 20 years thereafter between uh tallahassee and pensacola that served uh black patients and the significant uh and key players were um dr lhb foot um virginia hillier uh, who was a uh, nursing supervisor and um, Dr. Russell Lloyd Anderson, who was also a medical director yeah. at the FAMU hospital. He was the first black uh, person to run for school board in Leon County. And okay. his medical office for a time was actually um, in the two story uh, building on Macomb Street that's connected to the economy drugstore. Uh, Dr. Anderson had his medical office um, on that top floor for a time before he moved it to uh, South Adams Street when he was uh, medical right. director at the FAMU hospital. And in addition to him right. being the uh, first black person to run for school board, um, uh, Thurgood Marshall, uh, when he came to Tallahassee, he actually stayed with Dr. Anderson, whose house was uh-huh. on his whose house was on FAMU's campus. And um, a lot of okay. the Professors who lived on FAMU's campus um, did not want to risk having Marshall stay with them and, and, and risk potentially losing their jobs. But um, I think at the time, Dr. Anderson, he had his own private medical practice. So uh, Thurgood Marshall stayed with him when they came to Tallahassee to fight a lot of the uh, segregation segregation cases that were going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. but but the, the FAMU hospital. Uh, was near and dear not only to Tallahassee but to uh, North Florida uh, as a whole because okay. uh, that was the only place we could go. And it trained generations right. of black nurses. It trained and employed generations of black nurses. Um, the FAMU School of Nursing uh, did that, yeah. and, and they, they were trained at the FAMU Hospital. So right. Mil- Milliston Hollyfield is another uh, significant mm-hmm. Um, person who was involved in nursing um, at, at Florida A&M University. Okay. Um, 
so yeah okay cool yeah and i was i was actually uh you know i worked with neighborhood medical center and our our clinic that's on richard high school's campus is named the millicent high millicent hollyfield uh i think it's the clinic mm -hmm. and i was looking at the name today and i was i was i was wondering who is millicent hollyfield because once again we don't learn that information but okay so you just she, gave us one, one of the nurses she, she, she trained a lot of the like the lpns in fact there is a picture of Millicent Hollyfield. She was the nursing instructor and a group of black female nurses outside of Jones Hall. Uh, it was taken on FAMU's campus outside of Jones Hall in the 1950s. My grandmother uh -huh. actually was one of the, the nurses that she trained, and she's in that picture. Um, uh, okay. So Millicent cool. Hollyfield, she, she was a supervisor uh, and an instructor um, of nurses at, at FAMU. Right. Okay. All right, man. Man, you dropped a whole bunch of jewels on everybody here tonight. Um, definitely appreciate you coming through. I know we could talk all night, but I got to when I got to get up. I think I got to wake up what five thirty in the morning. We got mm -hmm. to do we're doing some COVID testing tomorrow. So, but okay. um once again, I wanted to bring you on here so you can do just what you did, like give give a lot of information. Um let me let me move this so they can um they can see your your name. But the Lake Trahologist is named blackpreservation.org is his website, the National Association for the Preservation of African American History and Culture. A young man who's been out here doing this thing, and you already know how it is with me and you. Whenever I got a platform, you just let me know when you are ready, when you are available, because never if I got a platform, you got a platform, because I love what you do, and I appreciate your, the, the work just can't stop. Man, it, it is what it is, man, because got mad love for you and everything that you do, and we got to we got to hook back up, man, and uh, make sure we get some of these projects done that we started and just make things okay. happen. But once again, like I said, I wanted people to learn more about you. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to thank everybody for for tuning in and um, just I know you learned something today. <laughs> I know you learned something today. Make sure you tell somebody about it. Um, make sure you spread his information. Black preservation. Dot org is his website, the National Association for the Preservation of African American History and Culture. Um, make sure you all visit my website. It's www.ontheshoulders1.com. Your home for African history. Finger history at your fingertips. The song, the stories of the sung unsung heroes of the African diaspora. And you can also support me on Patreon at patreon.com backslash O T S O G. Remember, um, Tell a friend about this video. Share it with somebody else. I know they can use the um, the, the information. Make sure you comment. Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel and hit that notification bell. And we, I'm going to continue to drop these jewels on y'all. Continue to make sure I have great guests. Continue to give information on this channel. This is my baby. Um, once again, the lecture, you the man. And just continue to do everything that you do. And no problem. And for everybody else, we'll see y'all next time. So. Peace out.